Good evening. You are watching NTV on this Sunday, the first day of December 2024, and we continue with that conversation with former Deputy President Rugadi Gashagwa, who has been out of office for exactly 30 days now. On the 1st of November this year, his successor, Professor Kithre Kindiki, took over office. And before we took a break, Your Excellency, and right now we get into this discussion nonstop, you stated that the state was complicit. In fact, what you posted on social media uh, was that this is a very sad, sad state of affairs and a major law for the state who are clearly complicit in these actions. Aside from the meeting that you have said happened at Tigoni police station and the fact that you're saying you cannot report this to the police because they were complicit, what evidence can you show Kenyans, the, the people of Kenya to decide? The officer commanding police station was present in the meeting in uniform. As soon as I arrived, he changed into civilian clothes, was present during the fracas, and did nothing. You know? And uh, again, I've told you, at the exit of the venue, one of the cars green in color by the criminals had blocked the road so that we could not exit, so that we were in a death trap, so that they just continued attacking us. And in the process, officers of DCI, in the notorious Subaru cars that uh, are unmarked without number plates abducted in clear view of everybody, Honorable Peter Mwathi and the MCA for Biblioni. Peter Mwathi was taken round in circles for eight hours before he was dumped on Bypass Road. The MCA for Biblioni, uh, who had spoken very strongly, was taken round and abandoned in Kenali Forest, where he has been picked and is now in hospital in a coma. So clearly, the police were part of this exercise. And I want to caution the state. I've been around for a while. I was in the Moi government. I was in the Kibaki government. I was in the Uru government. I was in Ruto government. I'm here today. The use of criminal gangs to manage politics is a very dangerous thing. These criminals, after you use them as government, they don't go back home. They just continue committing crimes. From the pictures that are coming from Lemuru, people are now calling us because they identify them. These fellow, fellows belong to a criminal gang that caused atrocities in the Mount Kenya region and Nairobi in the 90s and 2004, 5, 6. And what has happened now, once the state gives cover to these criminals to engage in crime, purporting to manage politics for the state, they will go back to their crimes. And they have already started going to Matato stages to collect protection fee going to dowry payment demanding a 10 percent going to hardwares demanding money once a government uses criminal gangs to cause mayhem like they did in lemur beating innocent people in a funeral mm -hmm. and that young man called arastas is a hustler mm -hmm. the parents are poor people they came there and caused mayhem today none of them has been arrested mm -hmm. so they get very embodied and what happens to the public mm -hmm. If they can attack the second deputy president of the Republic of Kenya in full glare of the media during daylight mm -hmm. with machets, with weapons, and nothing is done to them, so far none has been arrested, despite the fact that these are people who are known even with the criminal records, mm -hmm. then they set upon citizens and start extorting money. And the citizens will panic because they ask, if they can attack the second deputy president of the Republic of Kenya with police supervision, who am I? I want to say, number two, from where I sit, we have discussed with many people, and we are clear in our mind. Mm -hmm. Some peace caravans had been organized within the Mount Kenya region with musicians to go around to try to entice the people 
to give favor to the president and his deputy, who are not doing very well in the region for now. And when people asked why you said peace caravans, there is peace in the Mount Kenya region. Said these peace caravans to Baringo, said them to West Pokot, said them to Baragoy. There is an attempt to create chaos in the region through this disruption of meetings. Mm -hmm. Because you see what will happen, Karanja. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to go to Nakuru for a funeral on Saturday. And I was supposed to go for a church service in Molo PCA. When my supporters in Nakuru learned of what happened, they started organizing themselves to protect me mm -hmm. and to deal with whoever may want to mm -hmm. come and attack me mm -hmm. and create chaos. Mm -hmm. And I had to stop because I cannot allow that situation because that is what the planners of this violence wanted. The people of the Mount Kenya to start fighting each other. Mm -hmm. So they had organized uh, groups in Molo and my supporters in Molo, who are in thousands, started uh, organizing themselves so that if anybody tries to come near where I am, they will be able to deal with them. And as a leader, as a very responsible leader who cherishes peace, I had to make a decision to call off Nakuru, to call off Molo, to avoid a clash between my supporters who are in thousands mm -hmm. and the few criminals who have been paid. Mm -hmm. So I can see from where I sit, some people have sat down and said, this mountain, because it's becoming problematic, let us set up these characters against each other. Let us get this criminal gang mm -hmm. that is feared in the area, unleash it, give it state protection, let it cause mayhem, let the people protect themselves and protect others, and then the mountain is chaotic and then they can enjoy. Mm -hmm. I want to appeal to our people, wherever they are, even leaders have told them, because this criminal gang, after the Muru attack, they have started reaching out to leaders. Mm -hmm. Please, we can offer you protection. That is what they wanted. So that we have a, a situation where, for you to go to a meeting now, the state have, has absconded responsibility mm -hmm. of his role to protect citizens. And now you are leaving leaders to look for criminal gangs to protect themselves. Honorable like Shabu. if I want to go somewhere now myself, I say because what happened to Rimuru can happen, let me also look for other gangsters mm -hmm. to protect me. Honorable and then you set people against each other. That is a situation that should never happen. And I want to caution the government to be very careful. When those criminals were brought in the 90s, mm -hmm. they developed into something that was very problematic. Rooting them out was a very painful and costly affair. Whoever has sat down and decided that you want to engage these criminal gangs to manage politics mm -hmm. in the region, you are quoting disaster and you are when starting something that you cannot stop. I, I, I don't mean to cut you short, but you served in government for two years, yes. Honorable Gashagwa. Yes. And this, as you're saying, is something that the state has done. Is it something that the state has started doing? No, that thing happened, that happened that, even that thing, under your tenure. Our, under our tenure, it has never happened. We are very clear that we cannot allow criminal gangs to take over this country. You cannot allow criminal gangs to go to disrupt meetings and attack leaders and do nothing about it. Because you are creating a situation of lawlessness. But it was these gangs, Kenya. these gangs were there. They were introduced in the 90s during the clamor for multipartism mm -hmm. to deal with those who are clamoring for a multi-party state. Mm -hmm. And the they Shabu. developed, they developed into a very big problem going forward. Mm -hmm. And dealing with it was a very costly affair. From what I can see, and what I saw in the Muru, mm -hmm. and what had been organized in Nakuru mm -hmm. and in Molo, some people in government have sat down and decided that they won't use criminal gangs to manage politics. Right. Disrupt meetings, 
scare leaders, like now the really destroyed vehicles belonging to members of parliament, so that leaders are scared of going to meetings. Mm -hmm. Again, is a way of stifling dissent, because I think leaders who move around with me All right. are very vocal about things that are not right in this country. Okay. And I think this is a way of trying to scare leaders. But I can tell you, that is not a situation that can take, can, that can go for long, because mm -hmm. members of public will not allow it and uh, members of public who organize themselves and they all say no in fact the people of liburu are saying had we known yes that this gang was coming because there were our outsiders none came from that area mm -hmm. the people of liburu are crying that they did not have information they say they would have dealt with those characters we need to take this so we want the state to take over security mm -hmm. secure all meetings stop using criminal gangs and arrest those characters because from the social media, from the videos, these characters are clearly defined and they are known. And people are even putting names yeah. to them because they know them. Yeah. None has been arrested. Instead, they want to harass the senator for Kiabu, Karungo Dhangwa. Karungo Dhangwa was a victim. We, I came with him. We came in the same convoy. He was attacked. His vehicle was attacked. And after the incident, he went to DCI headquarters to report this incident. Mm -hmm. They refused to listen to him. At 10 p.m. at night, they wrote him a letter summoning him to go to Nyeri. The, the, the crime happened in Lemuru, in Kiambu. They are asking him to go to Nyeri. Yet, the local member of parliament, Mr. Kirago, recorded a statement at this year headquarters. Why are you calling the senator of Kiambu mm -hmm. to go all the way to Nyeri Yet the crime happened in Lemuru. In Fair Kiambu. enough. Fair enough. You made your point, Your Excellency. And we need, we need to take this conversation forward. But perhaps the last question about this political intolerance. This culture did not just start. Last year, when you were sitting squarely in office, and when the Azimu Yola Umoja One Kenya Coalition was running protests in the country, and instances in which you led the country because the president was out of the country at this particular time, we saw gangs, we saw people carrying sticks in the streets of Nairobi, intending to deal with protesters who are democratically protesting. So is it that it sounds too harsh now that the heat no. is on you? I be, let me correct you. That did not happen during the first protest of Azimio. That happened. The one for people carrying sticks happened during the Gen Z protest. Even during the Azimio protest, no, no, we had people in the name of business, people during, protecting during, their places. Let me, let me say, during the Azimio protest, because... At one time or another, the president was out of the country. And I was quite clear in my mind with our security apparatus that we must protect the CBD. Yeah? But the protests outside the CBD took on because the right to protest is, is enshrined in the Constitution. But destruction of property in the CBD is what we stopped successfully mm -hmm. and it did not take place mm -hmm. because you know this is a country of rule of law and the work of a government is to protect life and property mm -hmm. you protect both lives and you also protect property so what i do remember myself at that time when the president was out of the country and i was left is that we made sure that the property around cbd uh, is protected i have been very clear in this administration that we can never use criminal gangs to manage politics, to manage security, because it's not sustainable. All right. you, you, you create a monster that you cannot control. Because after the event, you have called those fellows to perform. Mm -hmm. What happens after that? They, they run amok. And since they feel that they have government protection, they operate with a lot of impunity. Mm -hmm. And we that is a situation that one cannot control. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your point is home, and we need to move on from this conversation. And Your Excellency, let's speak about a topic that many Kenyans right now want you to speak candidly about. And these are some of the policies and decisions taken by the Kenya Kwanzaa regime in the past two years. You are on record before you left office in an interview with Citizen TV and in an interview with uh, Vernacular, a car engine station, stating that you knew nothing about uh, Kenya's deal with Adani Group, be it JKIA and every other in, uh, involved entity. You are on record after you were impeached in a church at AIPCA to say that you advised President William Ruto not to get into the Adani deal. 
One Gashagwa who said, I was not aware. I was reading about this in the papers. The next Gashagwa says, I advise the I president. think you have listened to my address to the Kaleji Nation in piecemeal. If you listened to the whole speech, I said I know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. In terms of, I was not involved in the formulation of that policy. I was not involved in its implementation. That is why I meant I know nothing about it. Because if you are not, I was in government, I was deputy president, but I was not involved in the Adani uh, deal to that extent. I went ahead to say, but Kenyans are opposed to it. Kenyans are speaking against it. And therefore I am against it. At that time, because I was in office, you know, there is what you call the principle of collective responsibility. I was still the deputy president, President William Ruto. So there are certain things then I could not say, yeah, because I was still his deputy. There is still that, you know, relationship. But later on, uh, I have now the opportunity to say what I need to say. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have many things I can say now, you know, but that time I was giving what I needed to give. And I said, I was clearly, that matter did not come before the cabinet committee that I chair. It went straight to cabinet. Were you in cabinet when it came to cabinet? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. What discussions were there about Adani? I cannot give discussions in cabinet because I'm still bound by the Official Secrets Act. I wouldn't diverge in detail as to what happened in cabinet because that would be irresponsible on my part. But all I can say is that I was opposed to it. And at my own time, privately, I was able to sit with the president and say this is not right. Mm -hmm. It's a ripoff mm -hmm. to the people of Kenya. It is not tenable. And also, because I was elected, in our administration, I was the lone voice that would tell the president what anybody else cannot tell him. Because as an elected leader, you interact with the people. I also have serious political networks that are independent from the mm -hmm. president that talk to me daily so that I get to know what is going on. And as principal assistant to the president and as his advisor, I took it upon myself, and it's a job I did that cost me heavily mm -hmm. to always tell him the truth. The truth. Excellency, uh, Excellency, allow me to interject because you have said that yes, you sat in cabinet and you cannot divulge issues discussed in cabinet. This is a matter in public. This is a matter already addressed by the head of state when he announced that cancellation at the National Assembly and the Senate when he made his State of the Nation address. You certainly owe it to the people of Kenya to tell them that this is what the country was getting into in Adani. Who was tasked to do what in cabinet and how exactly was this deal reached? When was it signed? Those are the questions that Kenyans I have are watching you, today. I have told you want clearly. To I've told you clearly that nobody involved me. Had it come to the cabinet committee that I chair, I would have had all the details because that is a very exhaustive forum that I used to chair. I would be able to get to know from the beginning to the end. But cabinet is basically formality. And certain things, President will decide they come direct to cabinet without coming to the cabinet committee. So are you saying, because you gave us a track record of how many cabinet subcommittees you chaired yes. while in office. Yeah. This was at a time when uh, some quarters were saying you did not perform as deputy president. Are you saying that in the many committees you ha ha hosted or you chaired of the cabinet, this did not come out? Adani did not come. Did the Social Health Authority come out? Yes, it did. In the subcommittees? Yes, it did. What was your position on it? My position then, as it is today, is one, it was hurried. And there was no sufficient reason to move hastily from NHIF to the new program. And from my own reasoning, when I even looked at the mathematics surrounding that program, is that it would have cost us between 700 to 800 million to upgrade the system that was running the NHIF to make it compliant. Yet we are moving to a new program that is costing 104 billion shillings. And in my view, my very honest view, that's the crux of the matter. That is a rush. That is a focus, the 104 billion. And when you listen, you know, you know, you know, you know, Karanja, uh, me, I'm a people's person. And uh, probably many people thought that uh, 
I'm a rebel within government. I was not a rebel. I was a deputy president of a popularly elected government that is answerable to the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my view, we in government are the employees of the people. Mm -hmm. And the people are your employers. And their opinion counts. And you cannot dismiss what they think and what they feel. And that is why even members of parliament were accusing me of intimidating them when I told them to listen to the ground during the finance bill 2024. Mm -hmm. It's because myself, I do listen to the ground and I, I take time to listen to what people are saying. Mm -hmm. If you listen now to patients, they are going through hell. One, in NHIF, you would pay 500 shillings for the whole family. Maybe say you have your wife, and maybe say two children like myself, four of us will pay 500 shillings for the older people. Now, in this new program, it's each individual. So you find people having a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Number two, you find that the private hospitals have not embraced this program. The program was rushed before all the stakeholders were brought on board. So you find that you have been deducted money in your pay slip. Then when you go to a hospital of your choice, you cannot be treated. Mm -hmm. And that is the frustration that the people of Kenya are going through. And I am a very strong believer that your employer is ultimate. And the feeling of your employer is so central mm -hmm in whatever decision that you make. In this case, the employer here are the people the of people Kenya. people of Kenya. Your Excellency. And if you find the people are up in arms, and everybody is complaining, the stakeholders are complaining, Kenyans are complaining, you simply cannot ignore them mm -hmm. and decide that you must do what you have decided because it's a government program. Because that government program is meant to benefit some people. Mm -hmm. And if the beneficiaries of that program are uncomfortable with its implementation, with this component, mm -hmm. with the way it is being rolled out, you have a responsibility as a leader who is elected all the time to take into consideration the views of the people. This responsibility you had when you chaired the cabinet subcommittees in which uh, this shift from NHIF to SHA came. And for Kenyans who do not understand the workings of government, uh, many of whom are watching today, you may need to tell them if indeed it's true that you did not agree or you said it was rushed because it came to a cabinet subcommittee you chaired, how did it end up in the cabinet? You are the no, second no. most powerful person. Cabinet will work on policies. The issue is not the policies, the implementation. In terms of timelines, in terms of the transition, it's now when to go to the respective ministry or department that the whole issue of implementation comes into question. And this is where I'm saying, uh, in my view, uh, the thing is rushed mm -hmm. and there is no adequate public participation mm -hmm. because the views of the public are not being taken into account. Mm -hmm. You can pass a very good policy and there is nothing wrong with passing a good policy. But when you take it to the people, they have a different view. You have a responsibility to change your mind after listening to the people. Because at the end of it all, they are the consumer of that policy. You know, you, all these public policies are meant for the public. Mm -hmm. They are not for the bureaucrats who work around them. So when you do it, and probably you think you are doing it in good faith, mm -hmm. and you think you have come up with a very good policy mm -hmm. that can benefit the people. Mm -hmm. And when you roll out, and that's why public participation has become very instrumental in, a, in the new constitutional dispensation. You must ask the people, what do you think about this, mm -hmm. this program? Mm -hmm. If there is a lot of resentment, if there is a lot of rejection, it behoves you as an administration mm -hmm. to take into consideration the views of the people. You know, I have seen an advisor in the president's office telling people that their children will not be allowed to go to school unless you register for this program. You know, that is coercion. That is intimidation. If, if something is good, uh, Ibrahim, it is people who should be rushing to register. You know, a good package, something that is attractive, something that is beneficial to the people, 
you know it will be very it is upon people to rush mm -hmm. and do it but if it reaches where you have to intimidate people and blackmail them that unless you register for this program your child will not be admitted to school there is a problem somewhere Mr. Why, Kishango, why are you setting conditions mr Kishango, what level of responsibility are you taking in this situation that we are in you are speaking about a government that does not listen you served in this government for close to two and a half years are you surely lifting your hands and saying i am not responsible for but, anything uh, but uh, karanja you had the charges against me in the senate these are some of the charges that were brought against me in subordination because of saying no this is not right i'm told i'm in subordinating the president i was accused of not leaving to the principle of collective responsibility because in some instances i would say no this is wrong i have listened to the people and this program is anti-people so you cannot sit here and ask me to take responsibility when you know that some of the charges against me before the national assembly and the senate was that i went to the side of the people charges i'm a people's person charges which you through your lawyers completely refu completely refuted that's what i'm saying i said like we were told to go and uh, supervise the demolition of homes along the Nairobi river and i said no and i said that is not in subordination that is doing the right thing because one a government should not have war be at war with this with the citizens mm -hmm. We had made a commitment as the Kenya Kwanzaa administration that if we are elected to office, we will not have brutal evictions and inhuman relocation of citizens. And here, am I, here I'm being told to do it. And I say, no, I'll not do it. And I was defending that charge to say what I did is the right thing. Because even you, if you look at the UN Charter, there are certain ways how you relocate people. So... I have gotten where I am today because in many instances mm -hmm. I refuse to betray the people of Kenya. Fair enough. I refuse to betray the people of Kenya and uh, what is not right, I said it's not right. Mm -hmm. And uh, where people had a big problem with a program, I will tell Mr. President the people have a problem. With Fair this enough. Program. You have mentioned um, that the cracks of the matter and I'm sorry for taking you back, but it's really important that you bring it out. The crux of the matter on Shah is 104 billion shillings that was being used for the system. What do Kenyans need to know about this? Kenyans need to speak out. You know, you they need know, to speak out about something they know. 104 about. billion shillings, uh, Karanja. It's not 104 shillings. It's serious money. And experts have told me that it was possible to improve the existing system that was in NHIF at a cost of between seven to 800 million. Mm -hmm. Here we are spending over 100 billion. And from where I sit, when I look at the whole rush of this Shah Shiv thing, it is because of this 104 billion. Mm -hmm. That is where the issue is. And because in this, you were in cabinet, who was tasked in handling this? Who was tasked? The, 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 ministry, the Ministry of Health. Again, the President works here as a team of economic advisors who do most of the work with him before things can come to Cabinet. This is where all these details work, were worked out. And you have heard that even people in that Economic Advisory Council, their spouses are involved in that system. Mm -hmm. There is clearly conflict of interest. You know? And uh, the whole thing is not straight. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that is why Kenyans are agitated. Why would you want to spend 104 billion shillings on a system that is not necessary? It was quite okay to improve the existing one between seven to 800 million to do the same purpose. So you can see some people somewhere yeah, are, are conflicted. And that is why the rush, because for this for one, 104 billion to come out, the thing needs to be rushed. Who are the platform providers 
on SHA. Because I have seen documents from the Ministry of Health that indicate that for every amount that SHA will be paying for each procedure done or for each service offered, some amount will be heading or directed to a platform I think, provider. I think 24, 25% or something like that. Who are these platform providers? I don't providers? know. I was not involved. Nobody involved uh, regarding a shagwa. I was not involved in the procurement. I was not involved in uh, the, uh, the conceptualization of this uh, SHA thing. I was just there. And that's why I'm saying many times I was being told, I, President said that I, I, I failed to defend. Uh, he said when he was um, unveiling his deputy, mm -hmm. he accused me of having left him alone to defend government programs and fail to support him to defend government programs. But how do I defend things I don't know, Karanja? You, you can't, I can't go to defend that Asha thing. The use of 104 billion, I would have, be out of my mind to come to television to support something that in my view is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And which to every, to, from every perspective is pure theft of public funds. I cannot defend such things. You, I was being told to defend uh, Adani. You know, I, I said one day I was in a funeral somewhere in, um, in uh, Transoia, mm -hmm. and I think the senator for Kisi, Richard Onyonka, came very hard on government because of Adani. And uh, I was the last to speak, mm -hmm. and I said nothing about the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of people around the president called me and really abused me that government was being attacked and you did not defend. How do I defend theft? I cannot defend corruption. I, I, I am a man of integrity. And uh, much as probably the president says that I did not defend government programs, he is right to a certain extent. I defended the ones that were above board. Anything I did the alcohol program, I worked on it. Registration of farmers for fertilizer program, I defended, I worked on it to the last day. Coffee reforms, I defended. Tea reforms, I defended. Anything that was above board, that was in public interest, I defended. But issues of corruption, issues of theft of public funds, uh, I could not go and defend. And, and he must forgive me. I asked President William Rito to forgive me. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, my former boss. Adani, I could not help you to, to, to defend. Shah, I could not afford, I could not help you to defend. If the deputy you have picked can defend theft and corruption, let him go ahead. Because him is not elected, he is your person. Mm -hmm. So he's answerable to you. But me, I was elected, I was, um, I have the mandate of the people. And therefore I'm answerable to some people. So I could not go and defend something that is anti-people. Mm -hmm. Because I'm elected by the people. You know, you know that this is where the difference between me and the current deputy president is. Him, he is an appointee of President William Ruto. Mm -hmm. He must defend religiously anything the president says and wants because that is his employee. Mm -hmm. I was not an employee of President William Ruto. I was an employee of the people of Kenya. Mm -hmm. It was therefore right for me to fail to defend anything that is anti-people. All right. All right, Your Excellency, two weeks ago, or less than two weeks ago, President William Ruto made an address to the National Assembly and the Senate about the state of the nation, and he was giving progress about where the country is. This progress was for a period in which you served as Deputy President. What is your honest view of what the state of our nation is today? Well, the President spoke about the fertilizer program, which admittedly is a success. And I took part, I worked with it with the President, and in fact, one day, uh, a minister came and presented to the president a bill of about 1.8 billion mm -hmm. to distribute fertilizer. And I happened to be there and I told the president this is theft. You know, he was saying, for us to distribute fertilizer in Kenya, we need to hire a farm to ensure that the fertilizer reaches uh, the farmers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was giving like 300 shillings per bag. So, we calculated with the president and the bill would have been like 1.8 billion. And I did suggest to the president that uh, we could register farmers mm -hmm. using the officers of the National Government Administration. Mm -hmm. And he was agreeable. And uh, he asked me to oversee the exercise. 
which I did successfully. And within two, three weeks, we had registered five million farmers. And that program is very, very successful. Mm -hmm. Again, the issue of the strengthening of uh, the Kenyan shilling, that again is successful. Again, the employment of the teachers, uh, you know, 52,000 teachers, you know, give credit where you do, that is true. But there are issues, he talks about the economy has improved, there is growth, there is less inflation, all those figures. From where I sit, because I told you I was around during Moy time, I was around during Kebaki's time, I was there during Uhuru's time, I am there during Ruto's time. For you to know whether the economy is successful, you don't need figures. Just ask Wananchi, they will tell you. If you ask people who have been around through those four governments, they will tell you that the economy improved during the tenure of Mike Baki. Mm -hmm. Those are the good, they are the best indicators. Forget about these figures and percentages. Those are theories and statistics done at the Treasury, oh, growth of 2.7 percent, oh, I don't know, it has, those are okay. But if you want to know how the economy is performing, just talk to the ordinary people. Karanja, you live with this country. Mm -hmm. Talk to the people. What Ask is them. your view? I'm asking you. Talk to the people. You served in this government for half time. We, we are not talking about the government now. We are, asking, we are, we are saying, we are talking about I'm you, telling you, Your Excellency. the best people to give you an indication about the performance of the economy are the people of Kenya. And from what they tell me every day, they don't think we are making any progress. They think we are doing very badly. <laughs> And at the end of it all, they are the owners of this country. They are the people we work for. So what they think and what they feel is the most important. Mm -hmm. And any time there is improvement in the economy, the people will feel it. There will be improvement in business. There will be improved cash flow, the employment. All those benefits will tag along with an improvement of the economy. And I can tell you from where I sit, Kenyans are crying. One for taxation, you know. I was with a, with a police officer uh, who told me all those things that were happening because even them, yeah. they are very unhappy looking at his pay slip, the deductions, you know. All the people with the pay slips are very unhappy because the deductions are not corresponding to the service. Mm -hmm. Like now, this money for Shah and Shif, People are deducted when you go to hospital, there is no service. Mm -hmm. Again, we had a problem with the Finance Bill 2023 about taxation of primary agricultural produce, avocado, macadamia. So you find people have a problem. If you go to the small traders in Nairobi, in fact, if you go to Nairobi, Karanja, I would like you to take your cameras and yourself and go around. Most of the shops are closed down. There's no business. And that's a clear indication. If you want to know how the economy is going, mm -hmm. go downtown to Nairobi, go to River Road, go to Taveta Road, go to Accra Road, go to Nyamakema, and you find most shops are closed. In fact, people, shops used to pay goodwill of three million. Mm. You are being called by the landlord. Please take this shop. All right. There's no goodwill. Pay us whatever rent you can afford mm -hmm. when you have it, mm -hmm. but have the place open. Mm -hmm. So I can say that uh, we are not doing well. Mm -hmm. uh, those figures the president said, fine, those are figures. Mm -hmm. But listening to the people of Kenya, moving around the country, moving around downtown, we are not doing very well. And why did we not do well in the two years of Kenya Kwanzaa? During your inauguration, uh, you clearly stated that you took a country uh, that had a dilapidated economy. However, you were stably on the steering wheels with President William Ruto for two and a half years, and you're giving us a track record that the economy is bad. Why did, is the country still having a bad economy while you and President Ruto led it for two and a half years? I think you would have to take time to look for President William Ruto and ask him that question because he chairs the Economic Council that advises him. I, I never used to attend uh, that session. All decisions on the economic interventions are done by that team that is chaired by the president. For all of us, ours was just to follow what has been decided at that forum. Okay? Even if we disagreed with it, that decision was final. So at the right time, 
uh, look for the president and ask him that question. What you're telling us is not what you used to tell us as deputy president. I was the uh, many first times, year, the many first times. Year, the first year, I was very clear that we inherited uh, a difficult country. We inherited uh, an economy that was doing very badly and we needed to be given time mm -hmm. to work on it. And uh, I was so persuaded and so um, motivated to be part of that until along the way I found that I am not involved in any of those decisions mm -hmm. at all. Mine is to carry out what has already been decided without an input at my level. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that is why I was being accused of not defending government programs. Mm -hmm. And I have given you the reasons that you can, you can only defend that which you are part of. Mm -hmm. But if you are not part of that decision, if you are not part of that program, if your input has not been sought, if your views have not been incorporated, then it will be very difficult for you to defend that particular program. Yet from how it looked when you and public, it appeared like you are deeply uh, involved the first year, in yes. every decision. The, fa the first year, yes. Up to some point. The second in, uh, year, the second year, the second year, you saw me keep quiet on all those things. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a direct question. What is your opinion on the housing levy that was introduced on Kenyans on the Finance Bill of 2023, Finance Act of 2023? To be truthful to you, I have told the President countless times that the people of Kenya do not want a housing program. The people of Kenya are of the view that building houses should be left to the private sector. They could, they, they, they revisit the tenure of President Mwaikibaki. President Mwaikibaki opened the bypasses, built the roads, installed electricity and sewage. And then the houses just came up, mm -hmm. just go through the bypasses so that you also allow the private sector to thrive. Again, people have the view that uh, housing is a, it's a very personal thing. And people should be allowed to build their own houses at their own time. Mm -hmm. And that is why you find, uh, you know, many people are not able to tell the president that truth. Many people are mm -hmm. not able to tell him that truth. And that is why you found the other day when he was in Embu, he went to talk about that housing and people told him, no, we don't want it. Because it's reaching there. Because you see, what is happening to Kenyans, mm -hmm. they fight everybody else has failed them. MPs are not talking for them. Nobody is talking for them. Then they are left on their own now to address the president directly. It was very really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Uh, because that shouldn't happen ordinarily, where people are shouting at the president. It, 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 it's not right. It, 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 looked, it was very awkward uh, for me. But people have reached there because he was talking about housing so passionately to people who believe it is not right, you know? And many a times I, 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 I told the president, you know, you know, Your Excellency, I'm talking to many people. Mm -hmm. Professionals are talking to me, business people are talking to me, church people are talking to me. People think that we should concentrate on completing the projects that we inherited from President Uhuru Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. The Mawa roads, the bypasses, all roads that are going on, irrigation dams, provide the rural electrification. The people of Kenya feel that that is what is a priority. Again, the people wanted us to pay the pending bills, which is about 900 billion. They felt that the issue of housing is really not a priority. Mm -hmm. And it's a very individual thing. And they feel that uh, it should be left to the private sector. You know? And myself, uh, Karanja, I'm a people's person. Once the people are of that opinion, that becomes my automatic opinion. You and know, that was the, pre opinion. the president was accusing me of not going to launch housing. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things repeatedly he would accuse me of. You know? They are not interested. Because even many times I would go with the president and 
he would uh, he would start speaking normally he would take between 15 to 30 minutes depending on the mood he's in and how the crowd is and the reception so with the time I had started how long he takes mm -hmm. so once he starts and i decide that he'll take 25 minutes i would go and mix with the people when we are launching those mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. I would, they would clearly just say they are not interested. Mr. Gashago, you're telling us that most of the advices you gave, you're saying you gave an opinion about SHA, yes. it was never had. You no. gave an opinion about the housing levy, yes. it was never no, had it nor implemented. It was, it wasn't. Then why did you insist on serving for that long? Why didn't you resign? Well, you were in a government yes. that clearly didn't want to heed your advice as the president's principal assistant. Well... President William Ruto had not given me the job, so I was given by the people of Kenya. And there were a few things that I was doing that were okay. I was quite busy and happy to do the coffee reforms. I was quite happy to do the tea reforms. I was very happy to do reforms in the data sector. Which you claimed were eventually sabotaged yeah, by yeah, parliament yeah, yeah. up, to, up yeah, until yeah, recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but oh, I was, there, there was something that I was doing. I was working on the ACO program, and I felt there were a few things that I could continue doing that uh, were beneficial to the people of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And since I had been employed by the people of Kenya, I could not leave the job simply because I'm not being listened to, because there were a few things on my own that I was doing it would quite successfully. It would have been insincere, because uh, you are saying, even the ones you, uh, the, the work you did was sabotaged. You're saying you, give, you are given the job by the people of Kenya and you could not leave. No, no, it was, it, 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 was, it, was, was it was, by the work I was doing was going very well until a decision was made to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. And then people now started sabotaging the programs that I was doing. Like the alcohol program I was doing was very successful. I did very serious meetings at the coast, at Eastern, at Central, at Rift Valley, and working with all the stakeholders in the security mm -hmm. sector, mm -hmm. KRA, KEBS, and everybody else, right. who were able actually to bring uh, sanity in the villages mm -hmm. in terms of uh, drug and alcohol abuse. And my spouse, Pastor Dokas, was also doing a different program and our office on addiction and rehabilitation. And it was working very well. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, even if I did nothing else, I was quite happy to remain as deputy president right. to do that program. Mm -hmm. But along the way, uh, when a decision was made that I must leave office uh, by way of impeachment, a decision was made about a year ago. Mm -hmm. So it's been a long struggle for a year. That is when it was decided that I must be removed from office because I'm stubborn, because I'm asking too many questions, because I'm not defending corruption, because I'm not defending programs that cannot be defended. And uh, I, I, that is when it started now interfering, mm -hmm. the coffee subsector money that had been voted for about uh, for the cherry fund about four billion they only list 500 million so that i can fail so that then they can blame me of not uh, working on the coffee sector all right you know people like uh, the ktda we was involved in the uh, uh, the fertilizer program subsidization of uh, fertilizer for tea and uh, money was never released so that i could fail those things happened the, sec the, f the last one year. The first one year we worked well. I think right. the last year is when the president decided that I'm too much. He cannot control me. I'm asking too many questions. I'm not a yes -a person. I, I am difficult. I'm stubborn in his own words. I'm erratic and all those things he would say. That is when now the good programs that I was doing that were very successful were, were sabotaged. You've made your point. Yeah. Let's now speak about the current situation. Yeah. We are at a season where we are seeing you actively running up the Mount Kenya region. Oh. What is your... Kenya. Uh, Kenya is a country made of communities and regions. And in our politics, since the advent of multipartism, <clears throat> no region can govern this country on its own. It's always uh, people coming together and they agreeing on what to do. And uh, all politics is local. Much as I'm a national leader, as you come to the national table, you must come from somewhere mm -hmm. and you must bring something on the table. So I come from the Mount Kenya region that uh, President William Ruto asked me to help governize to support him. And I did successfully. Mm -hmm. And he got 87% of the vote. And uh, from where I sit, from the history of that region, 
that region, whenever it has been divided, it has always gone to the opposition. Mm -hmm. Any one time it has been united, it has always been part of government, either as a king or the kingmaker. And we learned many lessons in 1992 when we got divided into four Dasili and DP in 1997. So from 2002, 2007, 2013, 2017, 2022, we were united. Mm -hmm. So as a deputy president and, and as a senior leader from that region, I, I took it upon myself to unite the region for its relevance in the national political discourse. Mm -hmm. So that when we engage other Kenyans, we engage from a position of strength and, 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 and respect. And uh, one of the issues that we disagreed with the president was my refusal for him to create division mm -hmm. in the mountain. Because uh, the president wanted to have counties that he would control directly without the center. Mm -hmm. And I saw danger in that politically for the region in future. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was telling him, no, we can't divide the mountain. The mountain supported you as one. Mm -hmm. It should remain as one. Mm -hmm. And I started that agitation to unite the mountain successfully. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I think he was advised that it is possible to divide the Mount Kenya east and west. Mm -hmm. And they try to do that, but it cannot work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure the day we were in Embu, he went home knowing mm -hmm. that the mountain is one. In fact, the leaders who were there who were cheered wildly were from the west mm -hmm. by the people of the east, mm -hmm. President Uru Kenyatta and I. Mm -hmm and uh, there was somebody from the east the mountain is one so going forward even as i'm out of office mm -hmm. i have a responsibility as a leader for the, from that region to continue working on our unity uh, to continue telling our people that their relevance in the national political discourse mm -hmm. will be informed by their unity of purpose and i'm very happy mm -hmm. that the ordinary people from that region are united to a man mm -hmm. And the division is only at the, at the leadership level because there's interference from other people from outside. Uh -huh. But the ordinary people are one. So with this, with this information, then what does your future hold? Are you, are, you, are you seeking to unite the mountain so that you can get to join, you know, to form coalitions? Are you seeking to, the, to unite Not necessarily. the mountain? Not necessarily. I'm, I'm just being responsible as a leader from the area because the region looks upon me to guide on how we move on. After this impeachment, there was a lot of uh, confusion and disquiet. Now what happens to the, to the region? Where are we moving from here? So I have a responsibility to put our people together. Mm -hmm. And I don't need to be deputy president to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm a leader who is accepted in that region uh, and loved by the people of that region. Mm -hmm because they know me and they believe in me mm -hmm. and I, I am consulting a lot. Uh, I, I am not working alone. We are talking with other political leaders. We are talking with other political parties. We are talking to church leaders. We are talking to professionals. We are talking to business people. We are talking to the young people. And uh, this consultation is very extensive. It will take this December and the bigger part of January. Mm -hmm. I'm sure early February will have come up with uh, something we can give to our people. You've said you're talking to, to you're talking with other political leaders, yes. and uh, there has been talk out there that you are headed to join forces with Wiper leader Kalonzo Musyoka, Eugene Wamalwa, uh, Natembea, and those. I think leaders. people are. I think Is, people are, I think people are jumping the gun. Uh, Kalonzo Musyoka and Eugene Wamalwa are great leaders of this country, and uh, definitely we can work together uh, 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 absolutely and uh, of course myself and the people of the mountain were very happy with the stand Carlos Musioka took during the impeachment to stand with me and, uh, and our people are normally very grateful people uh, they, 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 they remember good deeds and uh, and we have listened to what Carlos was saying and we like what he is saying so there are opportunities that we can always work together and in fact there was a cultural meeting mm -hmm between the Gekoyo, the Embu, and the Meru, and the Akamba trying to coin something mm -hmm. that they work together. And I want to encourage, that's a very good discussion. Mm -hmm. Because you know the Akamba people are our cousins. In fact, it's unfortunate we had not been talking earlier. But you know, God's timing is always the best. So, but 
we have not agreed on any alliance with anybody. Mm -hmm. What is happening is that leaders who are like-minded uh, talk with each other. Mm -hmm. But before we can even come to that, uh, you cannot go to discuss with other people before you put your house in order. Mm -hmm. We need to put our house in order. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mountain, we made serious mistakes in 2002, mm -hmm. in 2022. Political miscalculation and clear lack of good strategy. Mm -hmm. And I own up on behalf of the region. Is this about getting into UDA without your own political That's party? what I'm saying. We made many mistakes and uh, I own up. And uh, I, I really, really want to apologize to, mm -hmm. to the people of Mount Kenya region. All right. That probably because of lack of experience at that level are not, you know, dealt at that level. I, I committed the region to an arrangement mm -hmm. that has come to haunt us. Uh, in my community, there is a saying that doing something wrong uh, is, uh, something bad is not wrong. Mm. What is repeating bad it is, is repeating it. Mm -hmm. We have learned very hard lessons, very painful lessons, mm -hmm. that uh, we went to a marriage uh, without proper arrangement, and uh, we were left at the mercy of, right. the, of the president, mm -hmm. which should never happen in politics. Mm -hmm. We will be more careful in future, and that is why this consultation mm -hmm is very slow and extensive mm -hmm. because we cannot afford to make a mistake another day. You cannot afford to make a mistake. And Mr. Keshago, one, you've said that you want to rally up the mountain. I've got a couple of questions which I want you to uh, join together uh, because we, we, we are pressed up for time. We need to be hurrying up. What makes you think that the people of the mountain will follow you? I ask you this having in mind that President Uhuru Kenyatta has a considerable following. President William Ruto has a considerable following from the mountain. In fact, he has more members of parliament than you who follow him today. Those members of parliament have also have people. So what makes you think, one, that the mountain will follow the route that you will take? And secondly, there is a feeling that you also need to overgrow the uh, politics of being only from the mountain. Where in your heart are other people in the country, the people of Western Kenya, Nyanza, and across the other 47 counties in the country? I don't know whether the mountain will follow me or not. That is a decision the people will make. Uh, mine is to consult and tell them this is what we have come up with and they'll apply their mind. And so far, they are the ones putting me under pressure. In fact, there are certain decisions they have already made, very heavy decisions that they are sharing with me on the way forward. Members of parliament are members of parliament. Most of those members of parliament with the president, none of them can go home. Yeah? None of them can go home, Karaja, because they lost the people. And I kept on telling them to listen to the people. And they say they'll send me home because if they don't send me home, I'll send them home. Mm -hmm. They send me home. Since they did, they have never gone back home. And it is difficult because the people of that region are very intelligent people and they don't take it for granted when you disobey them because they are your employer. All these members of parliament are employed by the people. Mm -hmm. When they disagreed with them on the finance bill and the impeachment process, mm -hmm. uh, they put themselves against the people. In fact, the group that hangs around me mm -hmm. is the only group that has been going to the people. And that is why criminal gangs are being organized to stop us from going to the people. Because the other group cannot go to the people. All right. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether you saw in Moranga. The people of that region you are saying are refusing condolences from leaders. You know? All right. They are refusing condolences from leaders because they are people who are very politically aware mm -hmm. and they decide what they want. So whether they will follow me or not, that's a matter that they will decide. And I don't have to lead them, uh, Karanja. Mm -hmm. My concern for the people of that region, and for the people of Kenya for that matter, is economic advancement. All right. Is political cohesion. Is eradication of illicit bruise. All right. It is peaceful coexistence. Mm -hmm. Let me say that you are saying I always stay in the mountain. That is a narrative that was used to drive me out of office. Mm -hmm. That regarding Kashagwa is tribal because he speaks mother tongue when he is in his region. Regarding Kashagwa is tribal because he talks about Bulima. 
Karanja, this issue of tribalism is a mirage. There is nothing. Mm. Did tribalism bring Adani? Did it bring Shah? Did it bring Shif? Mm -hmm. Did it bring the, the corruption of Ed Boyles? What has happened is that when people want to run away from the failures of the government, mismanagement of the economy, over taxation of people, massive corruption, mm. they want now to talk about tribalism. Right. Tell me, right. I'm out of all the issues Kenyans are complaining about, yes. Is there any one of them that has been caused by tribalism? That is number two. That is a question. That is a question I would want you to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would want us to get into once we come from this break. In fact, part of the other uh, questions I would want you to answer is some of your allies are saying President William Ruto, by uh, getting out of his government, uh, deci uh, decided by himself to become a one-term president. Is it a view you take? That is a question that Rigadi Gashagwa will be answering when we come back from this break because we continue with that conversation at his current residence here in Nairobi.